Now, according to Hosea 1, 10 through chapter 2 and verse 1, and Hosea 2, chapter, uh, and, and chapter 2, verse 23, even though God was going to make Israel not my people, Israel in this case referring to the ten northern tribes, the northern kingdom of Israel, they would become not my people, and yet he would reunite them under one leader, who we can call the Messiah. But the problem is, how can this happen? Because historically, the ten northern tribes were scattered among the Assyrians, they adopted Assyrian language and culture, they assimilated, and they ceased to be identifiable as Israelites. So how could they ever be united? And I, my solution goes back to the quote of this passage in Romans chapter 9, and uh, especially verse 25. Here Paul says uh, that God did this in order that he might make known the riches of, of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us who he called not only among the Jews, but also from among the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people my people, and her who was not beloved beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. Now, what I think Paul is indicating here is that God was calling Israel back to himself. But because Israel had scattered and assimilated among the Gentiles, the only way he could call back the ten northern tribes was by calling back the Gentiles among whom they had assimilated. And so, in my view, Paul is not giving a different application to Hosea's words, but is seeing the literal fulfillment of Hosea in calling Israel back to himself through the calling of the Gentiles. Again, uh, he quotes it, I will call those who are not my people, Israel, my people. But Israel had become Gentiles, so he has to call the Gentiles in order to fulfill that language. In chapter 3, it appears that Gomer has gotten in trouble and Hosea is, uh, has to uh, purchase her back. Now, I should mention that there is debate on this, whether we're still talking about Hosea or we're talking about somebody else, but it makes a much more coherent story if it's all about Hosea and Gomer. Well, anyway, in uh, chapter 3, it says, The Lord said to me, Go, show your love for your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. So they turned to other gods and loved the sacred raisin cakes. And so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lath of uh, barley. And then I told her, you are to live with me many days and you must not be a prostitute or uh, be intimate with any man and I will behave the same way towards you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stone, without ephod or household gods. Afterwards, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. It seems that Gomer, though she's not named, has gotten into trouble having run away from Hosea. And she gets so into trouble that she ends up being sold into servitude. Or an alternative interpretation is that uh, Hosea buys her back from her new boyfriend. But in any case, he buys back his wayward wife as an act of grace. And similarly, God continues to love his people despite their sins and is unwilling to give them up, but is willing to redeem them. Who says there's no grace in the Old Testament? 
Well, as the book continues, it'll uh, talk uh, in chapters 4 through uh, the end of the book, it'll talk about covenant violations. Uh, it'll talk about the problem of lack of knowledge of God. Hosea 4 and verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. Their fundamental problem is that they don't know God. And lack of knowledge of God means they don't have a spiritual relationship with God. There's no faithfulness or steadfast love. Others translate steadfast love kindness. The Hebrew word is chesed, covenant love. They don't really have a covenant relationship with God. And this is going to result in all kinds of covenant violations. There's going to be swearing and lying and murder and stealing and committing adultery and bloodshed upon bloodshed and so on and so forth. All kinds of violations of the Ten Commandments because they don't know God and much of the rest of the book catalogs uh, examples of where they don't know God. There's idolatry that's mentioned. Though God shows compassion here, even in his condemnation. You know, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals. They Turn, uh, burned incense to, uh, images, but it was I who taught Ephraim to, to walk, taking him by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness and with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. Uh, how can I give you up, verse 8, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? And how can I make you like Zeboim? Those were cities that were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. And so despite their idolatry, he still has compassion and love for them. He can't give them up. Now, one of the key verses we should mention is uh, uh, Hosea 11.1, 1, Out of Egypt I called my son, quoted by Matthew in Matthew 2.15. Uh, this is clearly not a direct prediction of uh, what would happen in the life of Jesus, where uh, Matthew applies this language to where Jesus goes to Egypt after uh, the, uh, before the killing of the innocents in Bethlehem, and at the death of Herod comes back, and thus, uh, Matthew says, is fulfilled what was written by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son, quoting Hosea 11.1. 1. But Hosea is talking about the exodus from Egypt in historical times, a past event from Hosea's point of view, not something future. So how do we reconcile those things? Uh, Matthew, I think, sees typology between Israel and Jesus. So just as Israel had 12 sons, Jesus has 12 apostles. Just as Israel went to Egypt and then came back to the land, so Jesus goes to Egypt and comes back to the land. Both pass through the waters of the Jordan. Uh, both are tested in the wilderness 40 years for Israel, 40 days for Jesus. And this was so that Jesus could be Israel's perfect representative in fact, uh, when Jesus was baptized by John, John in one of the Gospels says, uh, uh, you know, I should be baptized by you. But Jesus responds, go ahead and do it in order to fulfill all righteousness. Now, if you have orthodox theology, Jesus didn't have anything to repent of. He was sinless. But as Israel's perfect representative, he even repents for Israel. And I think what Matthew sees here is this analogy between uh, this uh, typology, God intended analogy between Israel and Jesus, uh, rather than a direct prediction fulfillment. 
The theme of the whole book is God's grace that's going to prevail at the end. It kind of ends in chapter 14, I will love them freely. So Israel is sinful. He sent them into exile. He still can't give them up. He's to love, he loves Israel as he tells Hosea to love his wayward wife, Gomer. Now, despite their covenant violations, uh, he continues to love them. And so this is a book about God's grace. And with that, uh, we end our introduction to the book of Hosea.